dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. By now, any Christian who follows events in the world knows how important it is for us to act. The news headlines are filled with reports of things that are happening and calls for us to get involved. On the other hand, Christians are equally convinced that we need to pray. Prayer is a part of our spiritual tradition and something our Savior commanded us to do. Is there a connection between the two? Is there really a value to prayer when so much of our brain space is taken up by issues and confrontations and worry about the future? I think there is. And I want to make a case for it. Hey, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here and that we have this opportunity. What a blessing. Here with the St. John Leadership Network, we actually have the ability to pause and to go deeper into issues and into questions that really are are something we face every day. And some of the most important of these are questions that are coming from the culture that's around us. And so how do we lead as disciples of Christ in our culture today? Okay, that's the question. And so it's important to first begin with reminding ourselves what culture is. I love the way that Pope John Paul II spoke and wrote about culture. He he spoke about it in terms of a prioritization of values. Okay, so like what you put as the top value and the second value, third value, and, and how you emphasize the truths that will govern your life. Culture is what results from that prioritization. How we prioritize what we think is important in our life And the values that we hold to be the most important over other values will determine the way we decorate our houses, the way that we dress, the way that we look at each other, what we allow on television, what we have in schools, etc. I mean, there's a hierarchy playing in the social consciousness that's allowing us to say that this is okay and this isn't okay. We're going to allow this or not allow this, maybe not in, in an individual level, but on a societal level. So if we say that respecting our elders is the most important thing to us, there's going to be all kinds of cultural impact that that value and having that prioritized is going to make from the way that we visit our elders to the way that we speak to our elders to what happens in the family dynamic. And given time, we could celebrate that with paintings and songs and dances and traditions and foods and all kinds of things that then codify in the material world around us that decision that we've made as a society to value respect of our elders. Okay, so every society has a culture at all times because every society has some sort of governing structure in the social consciousness, our understanding of ourselves as a group that then determines what we are should emphasize and we should not. For example, if you go to a little dog park in suburbia America, is it okay for you to say hello to other people? That's a real question. It kind of depends on different parts of the country that you're in too. If, if you move, you're like, oh gosh, I wonder if this is a place where people say hello. And if you come from a part of a country where people do not say hello and where everyone stands there quietly with their dogs, then then you almost take offense when someone from, I don't know, the Midwest (laughs) arrives and starts saying hello to everybody in the park. And of course, the Midwesterner, they, they could say to themselves, well, goodness, these people are awful cold. People don't even say hi here. What's the custom? Well, it kind of depends. That custom is going to reveal a lot about the value system of the place that you live. And that value system itself has been shaped by the customs of the culture that came before it. A hierarchy of values, right? A prioritization of values. This is what determines culture. And the reason I like that definition so much is that it helps us to get beyond just feeling like there's an us and them mentality in the air and understanding that we're actually involved in a mechanism here. There's a, there's a structure to what's happening in the culture around us. There are values that are being placed higher than others. Now, the real question, therefore, is, well, who sets those values? And, and who generates the values? And how do you control which values on top of the other? I mean, if we want the value of life and, and Christian love to be at the top of our society, 
Well, then how do we get it there? Who puts it there? Who makes up the cultural laws that are around us? How do we go about getting a correct prioritization of values in our culture today? Most of the time, cultural leadership talks all focus in on the the strife between competing visions around customs. Should we allow the national anthem to be played at every football game? Should everybody, you know, be given off for Thanksgiving? Should we celebrate Christmas as a national holiday? These are all customs. Okay, and, and they're great customs, but at the same time, they, they, all they do is express a prioritization of values that comes from something deeper. And this is what a lot of our talks on leadership today are just really missing out on. People say you should engage in the fight for this custom or you should engage in the fight against this other custom. By totally ignoring the fact that both of those customs flow from a decision to prioritize values in a certain hierarchy and that that prioritization of values, that set of values comes from something much deeper. It comes from a philosophy of life. When you get down to it, the the educational system is set up to educate according to a philosophy. The world of advertising arts is all there to build upon that philosophy to manipulate you to buy a certain product. Political media operates according to its knowledge of the philosophy that's governing in the minds and spirits of Americans today. You see, the real problem isn't which position people have. The real problem is why are they holding that position? Where did the understanding of what's important in life come from? And how did this person or this group of people become so convinced of it? The customs that enshrine a culture are not, in other words, the attacking point or the real, the real issue, even though it's important for us to engage there and, and make sure that we have the correct customs in our home, you know, that we sit down for family dinner, for example. Ronald Reagan, actually, when he was president, he put forth an entire philosophy that he said would change the, the country in its one family meal every day together. Well, I think all of us... Th- no one here could dispute with that, right? We all agree with that. We understand that, the value of that. We say, gosh, we wish we could do that. Well, then why don't you? And if you really want to fight a cultural war, start with having your, your family sit down for a meal once a day. What are you saying when you do that? You're prioritizing a whole set of values that are very different from soccer practice and dance practice. And I mean, I understand it. I understand the tensions. But you see, like, which value are you going to put as the most important? But even more important than battling one set of customs with another set of customs is establishing a foundation for those customs on the plan of God deep down inside, the way that he wants us to live our life. And you see, my friends, that's where prayer comes in. There is no more important thing that we can do any day in our leadership of anything than prayer because no other action allows what we do every day in our activities to be grounded in the truest and most beautiful wellspring of life, which is the truth of God, than prayer. If you really want to influence and form a culture in your home, in your business, and in the world around you, then you need to be someone who's bringing customs into that culture that are rooted in a worldview that is full of life, beautiful, true, and something of which you are certain. And that's, of course, what prayer gives us. Would you like to hear more from Father Nathan? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a two-minute glance at the gospel every Sunday morning right to your phone. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So when we think about prayer and its importance for us in our cultural leadership, right? So when I talk about cultural leadership, it means the impact that we're making on society, you know, in a large scale, but the same thing could hold for prayer in our businesses or prayer as as business leaders or as uh, uh, Christian professionals. There's just many ways that we could look at this and approach it. And I could look at it from a traditional point of view and just talk about how important it is for you to find psychological balance, you know, which is of course true. Uh, to the, the the monks, for example, who were the masters of the balanced life, they had the the motto "ora et labora," right, which means work and prayer, prayer and work. And the way that they envisioned it, I one time went to a Benedictine monastery and heard a Benedictine explain this to me, is that you come into the chapel to inhale, you breathe in God, and, and then you leave the chapel to exhale. 
You, you breathe out the Holy Spirit as a blessing upon the world. And then you come back in and inhale, back out and exhale. And the Benedictine monks, who've been around, by the way, since like the 400s, so you know something's working there. Well, they do that seven times a day. They literally have seven moments where they inhale, they breathe in God in prayer, and then they exhale. That, that's the key to balance. And of course, that's key to our life as well. I remember listening to a homily by Pope um, Benedict the Sixteenth before he was the Pope when he was in Germany, and he was speaking to his priests about the importance of making a holy hour every day. And he said, "Just think, men, is it really that hard to take one hour to recollect yourself?" I mean, in the world that we have today, where you have twenty-four hours, you know, to spend. I mean, if, if what is it? What is an, an hour of a day? It's four pennies out of a dollar, just to give you some idea, right? One, one hour is one twenty fourth of the day. Okay, so like you're talking about four percent here, just just you know. So you, when you think about it from that point of view, it's like if every day God gives me a dollar, and all I have to do is give Him back four pennies. I mean, this is this is really a great day. You're pocketing ninety six pennies per day, and yet we want to be greedy and say, "No, no, no! I want all one hundred pennies in my pocket. I just don't have any money to give you back." And God's like, "Wait a second! <laughs> yeah, give you a dollar. You can give me the whole dollar back." You know, "Oh, no, no, no! I just don't have the time. I don't have the money to give you back." Saying I don't have the time in my day to prayer pray is like saying to someone who give you a dollar that you don't have four cents. He's like, I just gave you a dollar. You have four cents. <laughs> you have time. In other words, it's how we choose to prioritize the values. What's the culture of our day? And, the, and Pope Benedict was making the point with his priest saying, listen, if you guys can't say you have one hour a day where you recollect yourself, you are too busy. And I, and I got to say the same thing. I mean, like the more that you're engaged in, in work, the more that you have to be engaged in prayer because your work flows from your prayer. And so if you're putting too much out there, then you're going to, in terms of working without that balance, well, then you're going to end up, I wouldn't even say just burning out. You're going to end up dead in your soul because you're not bringing in any new water into that beautiful plant called your soul. Instead, you're just giving out, giving out, putting out, putting out. In the end, Gosh, it, like our life is not supposed to be just about putting stuff out there. We're not just supposed to be machines that are producing things. God didn't make you so that you could be productive. He made you so that you could glorify him by your productivity, right? By your leadership. We didn't make a culture just so that the culture could be whatever, have this or that custom in it, as important as that might be. He, the culture is for a deeper purpose than its its own self celebration. It needs to be oriented towards something that transcends all customs and that is greater than all activities. And who's going to lead it there? I mean, if we just walk around saying, "No, we're supposed to act this way," and we're going to put this, you know, Catholic code on everything that we do, it's a fine thing. But in the end, that's not the same as Jesus. And you could have people who have all kinds of Catholic codes in their life. And those Catholic codes and, and the customs that you have with it might not bring them to Christ. And I'm not saying it's bad. It's a very important thing to have all of that. Okay. I'm just saying at the same time, there needs to be something more. I can be super busy. I could even be an atheist and go around promoting Catholic customs. Okay. That's not a question. But to be a Catholic leader, ah, I need faith. Faith is a contact with God. I need to have a place where I'm breathing in Almighty God, where I'm living with God, where I stop and where I lose myself in the mystery of who he is. Then I can lead you. If I'm not praying, what kind of leadership am I actually leading you in? I'm just becoming more active in a different kind of lifestyle. And again, it's valuable to have a pure culture and to do wonderful things. And I'm not saying not to do that. I'm just saying to not neglect the essential, which is to be with Christ. So your balance every day is much more than a psychological way for you to find energy and motivation to stay doing good things. It's much more than that. It's you honing in on where you're bringing the world around you. And honing in on it, the, uh, the fact that you're bringing your, the world around you to a person whom you love, who never commanded you to go out and do all kinds of this or that, who commanded you to love him. 
we were really good at following all the commandments he never gave us. <laughs> you know, we're like, Jesus, you need me to start another soccer team. Jesus, you need me to, to I don't know, to protest outside of this or that place. You know, and, I, and I'm all for it again. These are good things. But it's like, Jesus is like, I, I didn't make you for that. I made you to do those things, fine, out of something even deeper. And that's, I want your heart to be in mine. When we pray, my friends, that's what we're doing. We're putting our heart into the heart of God and the fire that burns in his sacred heart that, that and we want that same fire to be in ours, that our heartbeats be united, Jesus in mine, so that I live his life and that I can say like St. Paul, it is no longer I who live, I, but Christ who lives within me. Because then, then who is doing the work? Someone much more powerful than you. <laughs> it's Christ who's doing the work. And we who are his instruments. I mean, what a glorious thought. How can I unleash the power of Jesus onto my world? How can I let Jesus Christ himself touch the people with, with his love, walk in the streets, uh, be present with his mind? How can I bring his spirit into this world? Well, you can't do it unless you lose yourself totally in him. Surrender to him. That's just what prayer is. Prayer is a dialogue between your heart and the heart of Jesus. And you're going to tell me that, that Christians can lead the culture of war, you know, without that prayer? It's like, Jesus is like, I didn't come here just to bring a different, a different set of customs. I came to bring a separate worldview, something that's distinct and powerful. That's the source of new culture, new customs, a new sense of the prioritization of values. And I can only do that through people who themselves have had their own personal values reprioritized by me. And that's what prayer is. Every day I sit there and I, and I kneel in front of the Lord. And, and every day, you know what he does? He reminds me that he's God and I'm not. He reprioritizes my values. And he sets my heart on fire to lead that way, to lead out of prayer. Prayer is not an option for a cultural leader. Prayer is, it, it, other, if you're not praying, there's no way you can lead this culture to Christ because you haven't even gone there yourself. Would you like to start your Thursday mornings with a scriptural leadership lesson? Join the St. John Leadership Network, where Father Nathan hosts a 30-minute call at 6.30 a.m. in all four U.S. time zones. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So I'd like to make the case for the importance of, and the value of prayer for those of us who are trying to dare great things for Christ in our culture, right? When we, we take a look at all the ways we impact our culture from being the board president of our housing association to, to going to, you know, being in charge of, of something at our country club to being, you know, the, the, the lunchroom mom, right? At school, everything that we do, let alone how we act when we're in the workplace or how we leverage our business for Christ or all that we do is, is generative of a culture because everything that we do, we do as a kind of custom, right? We have these, these ways about us, the behaviors that flow, that shape the world around them in a customary fashion. And those customs of a culture, they, and they flow themselves from a mindset that the culture has agreed upon mutually around what should be more important than something else. What should we celebrate? What should we emphasize? What should we live for with, compared to anything else? And in our society, well, where does, where does our society get that from? Where does that generate it? It's a worldview, right? That foundationally influences the value systems that then themselves are, are expressed by customs that generate a culture. Okay, so if you, if you really go deeply inside, we understand what Christianity is and its power. It's a worldview. It's a worldview that's rooted on God in charge of the universe, a benevolent father who blesses the world that he creates and who creates each one of us with a mission to glorify him. And then who sent his son, of course, to die for us so that we could live through his son, glorifying him in the most magnificent way possible in union with the very glory that his son gives him back. Okay, it's quite a worldview. Now you're like, well, in those, in that worldview, what are the value systems? Well, the values that come out of that are, is the irreplaceable value of every life, the, the inviolable nature of human rights, 
the fact that our life is made for great things, that we should act and allow others to act in freedom, that love is the, the heartbeat of everything that we do as a society, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you can, you can go on and, and see, okay, those are the values we're going to prioritize over other things like uh, the, the sheer enjoyment of material goods or the sheer accumulation of wealth or power and dominion, you know, things like that. Those are important things, but they're secondary. They're at the service of the first, right? And, and so then we generate customs that allow us to enshrine those values and behaviors that create a cultural milieu that guides a society. It's very important. That's where prayer comes in as being so vital. We already talked about its importance from you as a personal point of view. At a philosophical level, what prayer does, though, is that it gives those of us who are leading to create customs or influence behaviors, it gives us a grounding in something that doesn't change. It allows us to say our culture is about something much more than behaviors and political positioning. Our culture is about the heart of of God about a God who is love, someone whom I know. I mean, what a marvelous vision for, for what this means. I mean, because otherwise you could just have two, you know, two or three competing ways of, of, of how we're supposed to live. And who's to say who's right? I mean, between you know, the Hindu culture, a Buddhist culture, a Christian culture, an atheist culture, all kinds of different cultures that we could have. I mean, on the one hand, you could simply say, well, everybody has their own way of worshiping and their own way of thinking. We just have to all coexist, right? And get along. And you're like, well, yeah, I mean, that's true. You can, especially if all culture is, is a way of life. But culture is something for a Christian that's even deeper than a way of life. Our worldview is shaped by the direct knowledge of the love of God for us. We live as sons and daughters of Almighty God, of an eternal Father who loves us so much that He sent His own Son to die for each one of us and who loves each one of us so much that He gave His body and blood in the Eucharist and established His church as the home for all nations. I mean, this is incredible stuff. And now, so now the vision that I'm going to take as a cultural leader isn't just of one lifestyle amongst many that are possible. I'm here to bring on a personal mission the knowledge that I have of God's love, the love that he has for each person that I meet and for everybody in my culture. I'm going to bring that love to them. You see, it's like it's more than a message. Christian cultural leaders bring more than a set of behaviors and a new set of laws. We, we bring a love. We bring a real communion with Christ. We bring something that's deeper than ourselves. But we only do that, of course, by prayer. What what prayer allows us to do is to become instruments in the hands of Jesus, but it allows us also to have a real understanding of the the power of the worldview that we're offering. I mean, we're offering a worldview that says that God is present in this world and looking for the world to be present back to him. That the God that we're proclaiming is a God who's looking to bring fulfillment, peace, joy to every single person on the face of the earth. And so the value system that we're putting forth is a, val- is a system that gives life because it allows each person to go beyond even the, their own health and even the values and customs are around prosperity to find an inner life because we've, we're bringing to this world the message that's coming from the depths of who God is and the depths of his love for this world. So then people are going to ask, well, then how do I pray? What, what is prayer all about? And of course, it, it, there's the height of all prayer is holy mass. The height of all prayer is you be going in front of the altar of God and offering yourself with Jesus to the glory of the Father at, at holy mass. There's nothing higher. And, and through the mass, then all the liturgical prayers of the church, you know, liturgy of the hours, that we pray, where you pray the Psalms and the readings and the petitions of the, of the life of the church. I mean, you pray the very same Psalms that Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph prayed themselves. This is incredible. And, and that, that prayer book is given to you. And it's something that we can pray every day in, in what's called the Liturgy of the Hours. But, but of course, all of that liturgical prayer feeds our personal prayer. And our personal prayer, uh, it's so simple. Guys, we can't make this too complicated. 
I, I think when it comes to personal prayer, my goodness, if, if you can say a lot of prayers, go for it. But remember that our Lord taught us the Our Father for a reason. He said, when you pray, say, and he said the Our Father. And I think if, if we were to slow our Our Fathers down, instead of being like, you know, the, the old ladies in the back of church, you know, boy, they can just crank those Our Fathers out so fast. And Hail Mary's been saying the rosary, it's incredible. But you don't have, you can slow that down and, and really pray it meaningfully. It's almost impossible not to let the power of that prayer and its simplicity and its perfection, because it's our Lord's prayer, uh, it's almost impossible that our souls not leave unaffected. The Our Father said simply, deeply, saying what you mean and meaning what you say. Your eyes closed, your hands folded, your head bowed. Once a day, it, it will change everything. Right? It, it, of course, prayer is a place where, where time ma matters. I mean, there's a reason why our Lord said, could you not watch one hour with me? And making a holy hour every day or at least once a week. I know guys who wake up, for example, at three in the morning or four in the morning and, and they'll make a holy hour every week at three in the morning. And there's a lot of men that do that. I think it's marvelous. It, it, and I know a lot of mothers who, who can't make it the sleep through the night. They have different worries or different things. They just can't sleep. And so they actually pray instead taking out their Bibles, their rosaries. There's a terrific custom that I, that I like very much of stopping by to visit the Blessed Sacrament. I mean, literally just every day on your way home from work to pop into the chapel, kneel down, and just for two minutes, say an Our Father for your family and leave. Prayer can be done in so many ways. And at its essence, it's when my heart is placed into the heart of God and I surrender my world into His hands. It's then that I'm really able to lead the world back to God because then I have in prayer, I accomplish all of the cultural leadership that I want to accomplish because I put the whole world back in the hands of the God who saved it. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at communications at stjohninstitute.org. That's communications at stjohninstitute.org and visit www.stjohninstitute.org and sign up for our newsletter to receive updates from Father Nathan.